Good morning. My name is Lindsay Draper. I am in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. And everything in me wanted to start off by saying, good morning, Trojans. But then I decided, no, this is somewhat of a formal matter. So I won't do that. I'll just let you know I meant to do that. Anyway, we're going to start by congratulating you on being here, wishing you well, and making sure that you know how incredibly proud each of us is uh, of you, even though we don't know you and haven't heard a word from you yet. Um, I am going to tell you one more thing about me and then have my fellow judges introduce themselves. Um, I am currently, well, I'm retired from the juvenile court bench here. And I am currently Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of the Institute for Lawyer Wellbeing. Mr. Allison. Good morning. I am Robert Allison. I am a history professor at Suffolk University in Boston. And I am also delighted to be able to spend some time hearing from you about the Constitution. So thank you for doing being part of the We the People program. Judge Draper wouldn't say it, so I'll say good morning, Trojans. Uh, I am Jack Barlow. I'm a professor of politics here at Juniata College in Pennsylvania, and I'm looking forward to a conversation with you. And would you introduce yourselves, please, and your teacher? Hello, I'm Aidan Jordan. I'm Kale Fuller. I'm Jacob Krauss. I'm Henry Charles, and our teacher is Mr. Dickman. Who I don't see. OK. <laughs> Is that right down there where it says Susky? Okay, all right, good. The question that we're going to be doing today is the first of the unit two questions. What were the major disagreements among the 55 delegates during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and how were they resolved? What issues, if any, were not resolved and what were the consequences? What changes, if any, should be made to the Constitution? Begin. Mr. Chairman. Two of the major disagreements at the Philadelphia Convention related to the issues of representation and slavery and were resolved through a system of compromises. Differences between the large state and small state interests led to conflicts on representation in Congress. The Virginia plan, supported primarily by large states, proposed a plan of representation based on population, whereas the New Jersey plan, supported primarily by small states, favored equal representation. Eventually, the Grand Committee created the Connecticut Compromise, which blended the systems of representation. Another major disagreement related to representation in slavery occurred when the southern states sought to count slaves towards representation, but not taxation. Northern states opposed this, with Elbridge Gerry sarcastically remarking that northern oxen and horses should be counted as well. After prolonged discussion, the delegates agreed to the three-fifths ratio that had been proposed by James Madison. While incredibly contentious, the ability to compromise on representation made the Constitution possible. Mr. Chairman, in addition to representation, major disagreements remained over the slave trade, the regulation of interstate trade, and the method of chief executive selection. Disagreements over the slave trade and tariffs, which had undermined the Articles of Confederation, also created issues at the Constitutional Convention. Until the Committee of Detail proposed the Commerce and Slave Trade Compromise in August 1787. This agreement eased Southern planters' fears over the abolition of slavery before 1808 and satisfied Northern shipping concerns regarding tariffs and export taxes. Both the Virginia and New Jersey plans have provided for the executive to be selected by the legislature. However, opposition to this method was led by James Wilson and Elbridge Gerry, who argued it would reduce confidence in the national government. Several proposals, such as selection by state legislatures or governors, were suggested before the Committee of Eleven developed the Electoral College as a compromise between state selection and popular election. Mr. Chairman, while creating an outline for our government, the framers' inability to resolve crucial issues, such as the daily functioning of our government, the relationship between state and national governments, as well as citizenship, citizenship, slavery, and voting has had a significant impact on our history and future. While the framers couldn't address every possibility, ignoring the roles of political parties dramatically affected the passage of, cr of critical legislation, issues of campaign financing, and election integrity. By leaving citizenship and slavery unresolved, issues such as the Dred Scott decision and state rights led to the Civil War and the need for the 13th and 14th Amendments and the lasting effects of the badges and incidents of slavery. 
Finally, the lack of clear national authority and state sovereignty has led to overreaching in cases such as the McCulloch versus Maryland decision in 1819 and the lack of authority to control voting rules, ultimately leading to gerrymandering, voter suppression, and systemic racism. Mr. Chairman, in order to address problems with our government, changes need to be made to the amendment process itself. While partisanship makes a constitutional amendment as improbable as it was in 1787, one possible solution could be the states calling another national convention. Cur currently, 28 of the 34 states needed to invoke the convention clause have called for a convention to address issues such as a balanced budget amendment. In addition, to avoid political parties protecting their own interests, a popular referendum should be enacted on amendments that would address political issues such as gerrymandering and voter suppression. While this might seem improbable, former President William Howard Taft asserted in a 1920 article in the Yale Law Review that since Ohio gave voters the power to initiate and reject the legislation, that they should rightfully be, be seen as legislators in relation to constitutional amendments. More recently, Professor Akil Ridamar has asserted that this would return the consent of the governed to the people as the framers had intended. Thank you. So let me talk to you a bit. I want you to talk to me a bit about the idea of another national convention, a constitutional convention. Doesn't that strike you as being fraught with considerable danger? Because you might want to do it to talk about, for instance, balanced budgets. But think about all the other issues that might come up. Just like the first people didn't follow the rules when they got together, what would make people follow the rules at a new convention? Isn't that a scary concept? Mr. Chairman, I would say that in our more modern day, a decrease in the secrecy um, would make the delegates to this convention less likely to take the convention towards more radical um, opinions and ideas uh, to discuss. In the Philadelphia Convention, it was held entirely in secret, and that is largely how they were able to get away with uh, creating an entirely new constitution as opposed to simply amending the articles. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to add that the situation the Philadelphia Convention was held, that it was held under was much different than a situation compared to today. While these issues are very prevalent and cause a lot of problems, the Articles of Convention was failing to keep the Union together and facing near collapse, such a radical change as the Virginia Plan and the Constitution was necessary for keeping the Union together. Given the, the polarization in our country right now, isn't there a greater danger that we wouldn't be able to keep it together if we had another convention? I mean, every time I turn around, I hear people in Northern California wanting to join Southern Oregon and secede. Don't we have a greater risk of that happening if we pull together another constitutional convention? That's okay. I don't, I don't want to take up your time. Mr. Allison. You're muted, by the way. Thank you. No, I, I, I was interested in a couple of things you said. One was uh, the Committee of Details report on slave trade and tariffs eased fears, but on the same hand, uh, by the same token, George Mason said after that compromise that he would sooner cut off his right hand and use it to sign the Constitution because of the compromise on the issue of slavery. I wonder if you could talk about that compromise in the context of actually helping the slave trade continue and Mason's Mason as a Southern planter. Mr. Chairman, there are there were some people who were so opposed to slavery that they called the Constitution a devil's pact in that while it didn't mention slavery explicitly many times, in many ways it instituted slavery into the Constitution, which with things like the fugitive slave clause, which would later be used to um, to make the Dred Scott decision. So I understand why some delegates would be unwilling to sign it at all. I wanna move on to some, some other issues. Um, 
And I'm, I'm wondering, so in the Senate, for example, uh, a state like Ohio or New York or California uh, is, is at a disadvantage, right? I mean, they're underrepresented compared to a state like uh, Wisconsin, say. Um, so how, how would you, or do you think it's important to ch shift the Senate to a more proportional uh, posture, right? To give New York and California three senators, say. Or five. I would say that this is not a change that necessarily needs to happen. In my opinion, the uh, representation in the House is enough to, to properly give power to the states based on population. And having a level of equality in the Senate for these smaller states, I believe, protects their interest and uh, in many ways would prevent the majority rule that many uh, politicians, particularly anti-federalists, at this time feared under the Constitution. Mr. Chairman, I would like to add to my colleague's statement that um, the, uh, the equal proportional representation in the Senate is purely uh, is a major reflection of our federal system. And if we remove that, a large majority of our federal system would be more or less eliminated as the Senate is the basically the bastion of protection of the federal system. So are you against uh, majority rule? Uh, what, what, is, what is your, how do you feel about majority rule and how do you think we ought to let it happen or not let it happen in the United States? So a large part of majority rule and the fears that the founders had for this uh, is described by Madison as basically the majority tyranny, where if there is a great majority rule and no ability of the minority to oppose this, then the majority can oppress that minority to a great extent. So rather than have that and have majority tyranny, uh, we would like to have essentially a system where all of lower the views are filtered out in a faction, like the factions are filtering each other out and just nullifying each other's like uh, ideas that do not promote the common good. What about increasing the size of the House of Representatives? Um, wouldn't that create more opportunities for factions to filter each other? Do you mean by uh, by size of by population size, or how would you? Propose? Well, let's say we gave the House of Representatives another hundred members, and giving the House of Representatives among the states, giving the House of Representatives more members while keeping its proportional representation is something that might improve representation. Um, by increasing the total number of districts, it's reasonable that you could have more interests represented, and all it would take to do it would be simple legislation. If I were to suggest to you that since people taxation is a huge part of what we do, I believe that the amount that a state contributes to the taxes ought to be what determines their representation in the Senate, as opposed to just giving everybody two. What would you say to that? We still have a hundred, but divide them according to percentage of contribution to the federal government by taxes. What would you say? This was a proposal very similar to this was given by Gouverneur Morris at the Philadelphia Convention. And I believe that it hampers federalism in the same way, giving them different numbers according to population would. But if I'm paying for you and what you get, why shouldn't I get more to say about it? Oh. I, I wanted your answer. Yeah. Anyway, good job. Good job. So obviously that last question was one that I would have had fun just messing with you um, to, to get you to give me an answer on it. You were just a joy to listen to. Um, the references all the way ranging from William Howard Taft, who I wasn't really expecting to hear about during the course of this uh, conversation, um, the Wilson, Jerry quotes, or at least stating their positions, Madison being the three-fifth compromise uh, person, were all 
highlights to me of your presentation, um, the devil's pack was a reference that I like when I hear people pull into the discussion that say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. They said, I followed this through. So um, good job and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I agree. Uh, and I think you did a good job. The opening was quite good. And as um, Judge Draper said, you were able to bring in a lot, but more importantly, you really knew what it was you were bringing in. And, you know, pulling in Governor Morris at the end with the whole idea of, you know, taxation determining size of the Senate, which uh, that was good. It really shows you haven't just done a superficial look at what was happening, but you did, dug into it and you also have thought about it and are continuing to think about it. You know, I, I disagree that having a conclave not meeting in secret today would turn out a better result. I was really alarmed at that idea that, you know, in a constitutional convention that would include, say, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, I don't think is going to do a better job than the one including Alexander Hamilton and Gouverneur Morris and the others. I don't, I'm not calling them demigods, but uh, I, I, I think it's really, it's really impressive. You've done an impressive job with this. And I really think that um, the constitution is in good hands as you four continue to think about it and take it seriously and discuss it with each other and with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's clear you've you've studied this uh, stuff. I mean, and, and when Judge Draper suggested uh, uh, proportioning the Senate according to the tax payment, you knew right who had, had proposed it, the Constitutional Convention, uh, and that's good. And of course, I am a fan of Governor Morris's. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Allison that a uh, uh, not having the secrecy rule, um, you know, we 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 object to secrecy and we we think it's a it's a bad thing, but it really sometimes uh, can be a great help. And um, you should study the whole issue of uh, markups of tax legislation and Gingrich's change of the way that the, that the House does markups on that. Uh, because when they became public, uh, it changed the nature of tax legislation quite a lot. And it, it changed the nature of the deliberations over tax legislation. So it's worth thinking about. Um, I, if we'd had more time, I would have followed up on your uh, equation of McCulloch against Maryland with yeah. an overreach. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, that's a fascinating concept, and I think I think we um, uh, we could have talked about it more. But there are a lot of other things that we could have talked about more. Um, popular vote for constitutional amendments. That's an interesting uh, proposition, and um, you know. It, that would make a huge difference in, in the way that we do it. The other side of that is if we started making constitutional amendments at the drop of a hat, um, would it still, would the constitution retain its same uh, aura if we allowed uh, constitutional amendments to become routine things? Anyway, you have provided us with a lot to think about. Uh, it's clear we have uh, opportunities, or it's clear that we will hear more from you as we go on. And um, I applaud that. I hope you will keep thinking about the Constitution. Um, this is going to be great prep for you when you go off to college. So um, congratulations. Um, we're glad that you made it here. And uh, we will look forward to future uh, conversations with you and, and hearing about your careers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Are there any other questions? I will stop the recording and send the judges off to their breaker room. <laughs>